was wondering to you in like 30 seconds to a minute, how would you describe like what ASIJ means to you and who you are today? Oh, that's tough on the spot. Um, what it means to me, I think it's really all I, I know because um, I was born in London, but I only lived there for maybe three or four years. And so really my life has been entirely at ASIJ. So it's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, as corny as it sounds, it's like family to me, you know, uh, people who are from ASIJ, I can easily connect with them, you know, even if we have nothing else in common, you know, um, the, the teachers there are kind of like, you know, parents. So I, I don't know. I, I think that's, that's how I describe it. Great way to describe it. And, and um, you didn't have to say uh, on, on the spot, we can always edit stuff, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you can always pause for like 30 seconds and then just go. But anyways, no, I'll probably keep this all in. I might even keep this part in too. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to the 52nd episode of Tokyo Alumni Podcast today. Our guest was born in London, but moved to Japan soon thereafter. He attended the American School in Japan for 13 years, so an ASIJ lifer who has graduated last spring with the class of 2020. He is one of four brothers. Um, all of his three brothers uh, attended ASIJ or is currently attending ASIJ, uh, Kai, Ian, and Lee. At ASIJ, he played varsity basketball for three years and was heavily involved in various volunteer clubs. As a junior, he started a club with the goal of breaking the barrier between international schools and local Japanese schools. The club was called Tokyo Sports Outreach, who hosted Japanese elementary schools and preschools for youth sports clinics and has successfully hosted schools such as Musashi no Gakuin and Aoyama Gakuin Elementary School. Due to COVID-19, he is currently taking a gap year interning for Earth Friends Tokyo Z, a professional basketball team who plays for the B League, the Japanese Professional Basketball League. His roles are primarily aiding in marketing and operations. From next fall, he plans on attending Northeastern University in Boston. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Hugh. Hey, thank you. I'm really excited to be here. I've always wanted to be on this podcast. I'm a big fan. Thank you for joining us. The youngest guest, right? It's, uh, it's very appropriate. We have the o oldest guest, now the youngest guest. So it's uh, got quite a bit of breath uh, for season yeah, so two. I'm, I'm honored. I'm honored. <laughs> So um, today we'll, we're going to be talking a little bit about, you know, being a student during COVID times, uh, specifically, you know, being a senior at ASIJ uh, when COVID first hit, as well as a bit about uh, what you've done with Tokyo Sports Outreach, uh, something I'm quite interested in personally, as well as what it's like to intern at professional um, basketball team in Japan. Let's jump into February, I want to say February or March of, you know, this year. So you're a senior at ASIJ. Can you run through for me the initial stages in regards to your personal experience of being a high schooler at ASIJ, sort of in the early phases of COVID? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I've thought about this a lot, but um, in January, it must have been, maybe January, early February, COVID really started to become kind of a topic. Now, it wasn't anything we were taking precautions against necessarily, but it was definitely a topic we were all talking about. You know, it really started to ramp up in March. And then I remember in March, you know, we had teachers here and there. I remember actually Miss Krauth, if you know Miss Krauth, she was the first one to, to kind of say, yeah, I think, you know, this is going to get bad. And, and we were kind of all a little bit shocked by that. But, you know, obviously, you know, I trust her opinion a lot. So that's kind of when it started to set in. Mm -hmm. And then obviously mid-March, um, school got canceled just for two weeks mm. and it was kind of an online slash kind of video conferencing remote you know we were trying that and you know it was a little bit of a struggle so teachers were pretty lenient about it but really from there that's when it started getting worse when we were in our online format and um, we got an email that said school's going to be online for the rest of the semester and really as a senior that was especially hard but no, everyone was pretty shocked. Yeah, I remember yeah. you guys were one of the first schools to, to make sort of that official decision that you were going to go online till the rest of the year. And, you know, your classmates, especially, you know, the other seniors, when they heard this decision, I was curious, did um, ASIJ students begin moving like to the States or did, were people relocating already during the school year or did most people sort of just remain in Tokyo? More so expats, but there's definitely people who um, had plans to move, you know, as soon as, you know, even when um, school went online initially, you know, before it was official that 
it was going to go online for the rest of the semester. There's already people leaving. So, you know, that was a big talking point among me and my friends, like who's going to go, who's going to leave. You know, I know mm. one of my friends left really early on and he didn't come back really till actually quite recently. So, yeah, that was a big, big talking point for all of us. We were all a little bit worried. Your friend who came back recently, just to clarify, this is an underclassman then? S- someone younger than you? Um, actually, no, it's, it's one of my senior friends. He went to the U.S. I think his home base is there. So he went to the U.S. He stayed there for a little bit. And then I kind of moved around the U.S. based off of how the U.S. was doing. I think he must have taken a gap year. He's doing online school. So that didn't really influence where he was at. Mm. But yeah, he came back recently with his parents. So it, it's, it's been pretty messy for a lot of us. As a senior, I mean, I imagine there was a lot of disappointment, you know, a lot of things you guys wish, you know, transpired uh, that a normal senior year would have. What would you say you were most disappointed about uh, in regards to those sort of lost months? I don't know. It's kind of a running joke among my friends that we kind of list all the things that we missed every so mm-hmm. often. And, or, or we talk about, you know, where were you when you found out that school was going to be gone for the rest of the semester? Me personally, I was taking a nap. So I actually woke up later and found out because my phone was blowing up and everyone was sad. So yeah, I think specifically probably our senior trip, although it's not school related, it, obviously we weren't able to do that. You now the obvious one's graduation. We, we got kind of a graduation, but it really, it wasn't really what we, we initially expected. Um, you mentioned earlier with the online learning. So that's been obviously a big talking point, uh, you know, both the collegiate level as well as well, pretty much every level from pre-K to high school. Uh, when it came to your experience as a high school student at ASIJ, what was the online learning process like? How did you know, teachers and students sort of respond to this change in you know, learning modality? Like my failure to define exactly what it was called is kind of you know, a testament to how kind of on the whim it was when it was you know, first decided. I think it was called distance learning. And obviously, you, know, you need a lot more time to put school essentially online. Completely online, so you're going to make some compromises. But you know, to ASIJ's credit, they actually did a good job. It was um, a lot of EDSV, which is kind of our Blackboard, or you know, if people are familiar with that, a, a website that has all of our schoolwork in it. It also has the ability to administer quizzes and stuff like that. So that was probably a, a lot, you know, better than you know, some other situations. But really, it was a lot of Zoom. I think that was like the yeah. biggest thing. A lot, of, a lot of Zoom. Yeah. We only knew about the, you know, how much Zoom we'd be using, right? I feel like I'd bought, I would have bought more of their stocks. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 no, definitely. When it comes to online learning at the collegiate level, I know right now you're in a gap year, but I imagine you keep in contact with your fellow 2020 classmates. What has been sort of the response, at least the general response within your inner circle or you know, maybe slightly beyond that in regards to how international schools Uh, student graduates have sort of uh, adapted or the lack of to their virtual learning? Um, I think it's a lot more difficult at the collegiate level, especially because, you know, bigger classes, more people. But I think for the most part, you know, they've been doing okay. I think actually, interestingly enough, the last bit of high school we had where we were on our, our distance learning system kind of prepared a lot of my friends for the college, you know, online learning experience. So yeah, it was, it was definitely a little bit of a training, I guess, for, for, for that. So they've been able to adjust, but I know a lot of people who maybe don't have good access to maybe say good Wi-Fi or have really bad issues with the time difference. Mm. So it, it's, it's really dependent on um, how lenient certain professors are or really how robust their distance learning or online learning systems are at their respective schools. So, so you decided to take, you know, a, a gap year. Was this a common option uh, among peers of yours? Surprisingly, I, w- I would have thought more people would have done it, but actually, surprisingly, it's not extremely common. I think it's, it's something that everyone considered at one point or another. People are a little bit, especially with, you know, the last bit of our high school lives kind of being completely online, they're kind of really anxious to just go to college, you know, whether that's online or, or hybrid or in person. So, you know, a lot of my friends opted to do that. But, you know, I think at one point or another, everyone kind of considered mm-hmm. um, taking a gap year. But it, it's just it's just not an easy decision to make because it is a year that you're not going to be in college. So, yeah. And it's like, what do you do? Right. I think my brother took, I want to say a summer off. I, I, I'm, I'm almost a decade older, so I forget a lot of things he did. But I know a popular option with young people is often travel the world. 
which is obviously <laughs> uh, the last thing you can do right now. So and then that option's taken away. Yeah, I guess it's, it's difficult to figure out what to do, huh? as you said, for an entire year. So your background, um, I was surprised when you sent me that you, you had uh, four boys. It's uh, yeah. very unique. I don't know if, if your mother wanted one, one girl. Uh, we're family of three boys. <laughs> no girls yeah, as well. <laughs> And um, all ASIJers too. Um, I'm not sure the exact statistics of this. I might ask ASIJ about this sometime. But there's surprisingly a number of us, you know, ASIJ lifers, those who have been at ASIJ for, you know, the full K through 12 experience. So, you know, you've gone through it as of ho- as of, as have I. And I was wondering to you in like 30 seconds to a minute, how would you describe like what ASIJ means to you and who you are today? Oh, that's tough on the spot. Um... What it means to me, I think it's really all I, I know because um, I was born in London, but I only lived there for maybe three or four years. And so really my life has been entirely at ASIJ. So it's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, as corny as it sounds, it's like family to me, you know, uh, people who are from ASIJ, I can easily connect with them, you know, even if we have nothing else in common, you know, um, the, the teachers there are kind of like, you know, parents. So I, I don't know. I, I think that's, that's how I describe it. Great way to describe it. And, and- um, you didn't have to say uh, on on the spot. We can always edit stuff, right? <laughs> you can always pause for like thirty seconds and then just go. But anyways, now I'll probably keep this all in. I might even keep this part in too. <laughs> As you were saying, yeah, like, like parents. Um, I forgot to mention earlier when you asked me if I knew Kathy Krauth. Yeah, she was my teacher in grade nine and and twelve. Uh, so yeah, I, I I do recall her. Um, I think she taught. Asian history and Japan seminar. I don't know if they're still yeah, class. Japan seminar, yeah, but that's the class I took. In, oh, in wow, okay. So it's still, yeah, still going strong. That's, that's excellent to hear. Yeah, um, yeah for sure. Part of that class used to be going to Okinawa. Uh, have they discontinued that or was that part of it? Actually, yeah, that was, a, that was, it, she was looking forward to it, but, you know, obviously with COVID, she had to discontinue it or just for the year. So, so it was like canceled. But I, I know that she was trying to make some kind of alternative but I mean, it really just got to a point where it wasn't worth it. So yeah, that, that's one thing I'm, I guess, one thing I was looking forward to that I can, I mean, JSM is a hard class. So, you know, that was supposed to be the reward. That was supposed to be, you know, the, the light at the end of the tunnel. But really. <laughs> yeah, if, if uh, Mrs. Croft is watching, yeah, it's too hard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I recall that class very well. Too. But uh, moving on to, uh, you know, what you've done in high school, uh, you started this club, which actually touches upon something I've talked about with a lot of other alumni, you know, ASIJ or just any other international school in Tokyo sort of collaborating more with the local community. So can you tell us a little bit about the club you started and, you know, what type of activities you guys have initiated? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I could I could literally talk about this, you know, forever, but I think it's it's something I've noticed, especially with my internship now, you know, more so than ever, but, you know, ASIJ is kind of a bit of a bubble. It's, you know, I'm not saying it's, you know, I'm not, not, I'm not saying it's not a good, you know, depiction of what Japan is, but I, I just think it's, it's just a separate reality a little bit. And, you know, you can go to ASIJ for 12, 13 years, like I did, and not really experience, you know, what Japan is, or, you know, the culture of Japan. And, I think we got kind of like a feel, like a touch of that in, in elementary school. I know we had some kind of like exchange program or some um, collaborations with Japanese local schools, but really I think that stopped in, you know, late middle school and especially when we got to high school. So, you know, I, I thought maybe this would be, you know, a good opportunity with, with the freedom I got in high school to maybe start something to mm-hmm. that, that, that touches on that issue. So, yeah, I, I wanted to kind of, you know, even if it's just the schools like geographically like around ASIJ, you know, I would have liked to collaborate with them. It, you know, interestingly enough, um, you mentioned Musashi no Gakuen. That school is, you know, literally hundreds of meters away from the school and people pass it every single day. Yet mm-hmm. we really didn't have any interactions with them. You know, like yeah. that was the first time learning about it when I reached out to them. So, you know, I thought what a great opportunity and they were, they were totally into the idea and and we've had many clinics, sports clinics with them. So yeah, I thought that was super necessary for the school. This project that you initiated has, has it been uh, succeeded by your underclassmen? What, what is sort of the status of the project today? Um, Initially it was started with me and my friend Dylan and we kind of had an advisor who was part of um, the, um, 
kind of the Japan center of, it's called the Japan center, but it was kind of the uh, department at SIJ that tried to get more in touch with, you know, the culture of Japan. And so, so the person who was in charge of that, Ms. Takano, we were kind of working alongside her, but she was helping us communicate and with the schools and, and helping out with the correspondence and stuff like that. So um, kind of, we, we left it to her. Obviously we, we chose people who are um, with us throughout um, our time running the, the club. Um, and they kind of became the leaders, if you will, for the clubs. But Miss Takano has kind of just been there um, helping out. And, and yeah, she was definitely super, super, super useful. Yeah, I think that's an awesome initiative you guys took. And I, I agree with you. That's a lot of these experiences with the Japanese schools that stick with you, right? And there's just so many of them. Um, I, I can recall middle school, we had this soccer team. Uh, we didn't lose a game, but we played one Japanese school that was very good. And we lost six to one. And I remember that was very memorable for me. Like you know, <laughs> the world said it's, it's bigger. It's bigger than just the Kanto Plains. And you know, yeah, no, much- definitely. <laughs> it's interesting seeing um, these kids' faces when they walk onto campus. They're, they're yeah. kind of just like shell shocked. They're like, it's like they're walking into a different country or something. <laughs> All right. So going back to sort of this, you know, ASIJ lifer experience, uh, you also have this unique perspective that you've seen your brothers graduate and go through the system. And I, I guess the oldest you've, you've seen go through the college system as well. So yeah. when it comes to, you know, identity of, you know, being half Japanese, half American, have your brothers all gone very similar routes or have you guys had very different characteristics in regards to, you know, how much your sort of, you know, your percentage that's Japanese and the percentage of you that's American. Yeah, that, that's, that's really interesting. Um, well, me and me and my brothers, we we're, we're very competitive. I think in that sense, we're not very similar because we're always competing with each other. And, you know, we tend to resent certain characteristic traits and, and, and stuff like that. But really, I think in terms of the, the, the identity, uh, it's tough because really at, being at ASIJ to kind of maintain your, you know, Japanese speaking ability as well as being more in touch with Japanese culture, you, you need to do stuff outside of school, you know, so it's almost, you know, directly a function of how hard you want to work. For example, my, my eldest brother watched a lot of Japanese TV, tried to read the newspaper, studied on his own. Know, tried to make Japanese friends, so he was forced to talk to talk Japanese. You know, got him to be more in touch with his Japanese side. Whereas, you know, maybe me or you know some of my other <laughs> brothers, maybe they aren't so keen on on really pushing the the Japanese side, just because it's kind of the natural reaction. Being ISIJ, everything's taught in very English, and you know, the the culture is very American, so it's a little bit difficult to being half Japanese, trying to appreciate both cultures equally. Mm. That makes would, sense. would you say when it comes to linguistics, do you f- feel like working in Japan the past, you know, three, four months, has that really pushed you to sort of, you know, take, take yourself on to the next level when it comes to things like keigo and kenjogo, all that stuff that I thought I'd never use, which I needed to use immediately <laughs> when I graduated. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I, I'm, I'm really glad I did this internship and I'm still doing it because I kind of knew that I was a little bit behind in Japanese yet, you know, I really didn't know the extent of it because when you're in the workforce, there's just so many layers to, you know, linguistic ability that you just don't understand. You, you mentioned it like Keigo, Kenjogo, Sonkeigo, all that stuff is just, it, it's just so difficult. So yeah, it did help me improve a little bit, I, but I will admit still, a long ways to go and I, I hope to you know keep improving so earth friend tokyo z all right so a mouthful of a basketball team name professional uh, team in the b league uh, can you tell us a bit more about this team you know what how did you decide to go from you know attending northeastern uh interning for them it, it was a bit of a contentious topic among me and me and my my parents about whether i should go to school physically or maybe I should do online or maybe I should take a gap year but you know I think maybe this was this opportunity which presented itself was what mainly kind of got me to pull the trigger and and take the gap year Um, it's mostly kind of you know general intern work but you know I I'm interested in basketball personally so that's why I did it but you know 
Now, as I mentioned before, a big part of it is, is learning Japanese really at a, a business level, being able to apply what I've done so far、um, linguistically. So, yeah, I think those are the reasons I did it. And, and so far, it's been, it's been pretty tough.、Mm-hmm. I'm not going to lie, it's, it's been very tough, actually, but definitely a learning experience.、Um, definitely a change from ASIJ. When, when you say, you know, the sort of this adapting to the Japanese corporate environment,、um, have you sort of Refined your skills in regards to like meishi, you know, like uke watashi, and like these small things. Or, like, I was wondering because you're half, you know, American, people can tell you're not Japanese. So, do you ever kind of get a pass for certain things because you don't look Japanese? Yeah,、uh, the gaijin pass. I think, I think I get it a lot. And, you know, I'm not going to act like I don't like it because I've actually taken advantage of it a little bit.、Um, so, one example is. Throughout high school, in, in any Japanese context, I went by、um, Abe Hyu, which is Abe is like my mom's maiden name.、Mm. And it's just a little bit easier because my first name can be kanji, and Abe obviously is, is a, is, can be written in kanji. So that was just how I went about my name in, in, in high school. But you know, in, in the workforce, I knew you know, I needed some of those passes. So I just went by Maguaya Hyu. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's two different, different sounds, definitely. And yeah, I'm sure Abe people,、um, people ever bring up the prime minister. Yeah, yeah. It's a different kanji, but yeah, I, I do get that a lot, actually. I was, I was wondering that because my last name's Harris. So、okay. I'm,、uh, I'm not excited about the next four years. I know wherever I go now, people. <laughs> but right, at right, least right. it's like someone, you know, like reasonable to be associated with.、It's、yeah,、like、yeah, yeah. No, that's good. <laughs> It's not some terrible name. I, I don't know. I, there's some that come up to my head, but I don't want to say it. I don't want to offend it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but、uh, that, that's interesting. And、um, yeah, we mentioned that Kenjo go, Keigo, you know, getting this sort of, I, you mentioned yeah, Gaijin Pass. How about the reverse, though? Do you ever have times where you use your Japanese ness to your advantage? um That's interesting. I, I don't think I've thought about that a lot. I think maybe a little bit. um It's, it's definitely. When I'm kind of talking to, say, you know, fully American people, it's, it's definitely interesting to talk to them, you know, having the experiences I've had and being from a different perspective. But you know, I don't think I've ever used it to my advantage. You know, one thing, maybe this is unrelated, but you know, every time I'm in you know, a store, say, or maybe a place in Japan where I need to interact with a Japanese person, they, they often assume I am. American, they try to speak to me in English, but you know, I, I, I talk back in Japanese and they get pretty, pretty interested, pretty, pretty amazed. So, yeah, I think maybe that's, that's the only way it's really influenced my everyday life. And what I'm curious too is, especially when you know, you're younger, I think there's still a lot more. I was just talking about this the other day with,、uh, with, with Michael Thornton about you know, sort of your identity of who you are, et cetera. And I know like, There's this term, I guess, microaggressions. I know that's kind of like a m- more mainstream term now, but I don't know, do you, I, and I, I don't want to deviate too much, but it's like sometimes I feel like people talk about these things, but I've never really felt it, especially being in Japan. I don't look at it as a microaggression when someone starts speaking English to me. So I was wondering, like, do you, is, like, what are your perspectives in regards to sort of that type of language? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know exactly what you're talking about. I think personally, I think it's all about intent. So,、mm. you know, I've, I've been in situations where I, I was at a restaurant, like a Japanese washoku restaurant, and the waitress came over and like kind of gave me a fork. And I'm like, oh, no, it's okay. I mean, the, I, I guess you could characterize or sorry, categorize that as、um, maybe a microaggression. But, you know, I don't really get offended by it because I think it's, it's you know, it, it's with good intentions.、Um, Obviously, I, maybe the assumption when you look at me is that I can't speak Japanese. I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's a fair assumption. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't get offended by it. It, it gets annoying sometimes, but, you know, I'm, I'm not mad at it. So, you know, working in this Japanese environment,、um, and, you know, you obviously haven't worked in the States yet,、uh, so maybe it's hard to compare, but, you know, what has been, you know, the experience like so far? Yeah.、Um, It is definitely a unique experience. I, I do have a few points. One thing I noticed was it's, it's very hierarchical. I think people value hierarchy. Kind of one anecdote is that in my office, 
there's a little sheet of paper, like an A4 size sheet of paper um, taped to the front of the room. And it is, it is literally like a ranking. So, mm-hmm. so this person is at uh, the top and this person's here and this person's here. And, and obviously I haven't experienced what an American workplace is like, but you know, I thought that was pretty unique to Japan, I would, I would guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's pretty so. intense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's a good way to define my experience is pretty intense. Uh, everyone works really hard, you know, needless to say, I mean, you know, like it's not really a nine to five. It's, it's more of a really eight to whatever time your work finishes or, you know, whenever time you feel like you won't, you know, be pressured because that's mm-hmm. a big, b- big thing because some people can leave at five, but would that bode well for them really? Because, you know, there's a lot of pressure to stay longer. You know, I don't want to get in too much detail, but I've, I've, I've literally had like 14 hour days and like kind of a testament to how hard, you know, Japanese people work. And has, I mean, obviously we're looking quite a bit into the future, but I think a big decision a lot of, you know, happies have to make is, you know, are they going to come back to Japan? So do you feel like, now that you've sort of experienced a workplace in Japan that maybe your heartstrings are being slightly tugged towards maybe starting the career in the USA, are you still very much, you know, Tokyo is my home mentality? Definitely planning on working in the U.S. or at least for a, for an American company or um, company based in the U.S. You know, if that brings me back here, you know, that's that's really the ideal situation for me. But, you know, I don't want to define the Japanese workforce based off of one experience as an intern for kind of like a little bit of a unique company but you know i I do think asij has has developed me into kind of a shakaijin for the u.s really Mm. and maybe someone who can hold conversations you know maybe work on stuff if 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 they're related to japan but i i really don't see myself working full-time in japan as for a japanese company company it's it just i just don't think i have the skill set yeah it's it's definitely an interesting decision everyone makes and i was one of those people that was very much like tokyo 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 and um that disappeared quite quickly uh, once i was shakaijin <laughs> um, about a year about i worked for about a year in tokyo and then, and then i left but yeah that, that's really intriguing that you're getting this life you know after college experience ironically before college so yeah pretty sweet you got the best of both worlds so at the yeah. end here i like to um i like to have the guests sort of tell us what is to come in the next few years as well as the next few decades share with us you know what is on the horizon obviously i'm, I'm a little bit younger than your other guests so you know i might be a little bit inaccurate in, in in my projections but yeah so i'm hoping to finish my internship sometime this year and then go to the u.s obviously to study in Northeastern, as you said, and study business, hopefully work in the U.S. for some kinds of financial institution. I'm not really sure specifically yet. So yeah, I mean, I think the sky's the limit, but you know, that's kind of the general blueprint. Awesome. I think you're the first person to say sky's the limit for the future. So it's very bright <laughs> future in front of us, especially as you know, in these dark times with COVID. Um, hopefully you'll be back, back on campus uh, next fall. And it, it seems like, you know, at this rate, uh, we're on target for that. Um, yeah, this was episode 52. Uh, thank you for um, zooming in from Tokyo with us today, Hugh. And um, hopefully we'll see you again in a future episode, maybe uh, when you're at Northeastern next time. <laughs> All right, thanks for having me.